My name is Kirsten Tynan. I'm Executive Director of the Fully Informed Jury Association, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar entitled 20 Million Angry Men, A Conversation with Professor James Benal. And James Benal is indeed our guest today. Welcome, James. I have a, a nice introduction prepared for you, but hello. Thank you. Uh, let's see. James Benal is an associate professor of law, criminology, and criminal justice at California State University, Long Beach. He holds a PhD from the University of California, Irvine, an LLM from Georgetown University, and a JD from the Thomas Jefferson School of Law. He is faculty advisor for Rising Scholars and the executive director of Project Rebound, both organizations work to ensure the success of formerly incarcerated students on campus. Professor Benal's research focuses on the civic marginalization of those with criminal convictions and the exclusion of those with a felony conviction from the jury process, which is what we'll be talking with him about today. As the leading scholar on the topic, he has testified for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, the California Senate and Assembly, and presented his research to the American Bar Association Jury Commission. So thank you for being with us today. Um, for those of you joining us, if you have questions and you are on Zoom, there is a little Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that and type your question in the Q&A section. If you are on Facebook, feel free to type your comment uh, or question in the comments, and I'm going to do my very best to keep an eye on that. Um, but I've got things all over my screen. So my first focus will be on the Zoom questions and second on Facebook. So hopefully we'll get all of those. Feel free to type those in and I'll try to work them in as we go. But just to get started, James, can you give us a bit of information about yourself and how you became interested in the restrictions placed on people with felony convictions serving as jurors. Sure, well first, Kristen, thank you very much for having me. I, I was um, ecstatic to find that there was a group of jury nerds out there like me that existed. Um, so I was excited to come talk to you about, you know, jury nerd stuff, right, which is great. Um, but in all seriousness, how this topic uh, came up for me, so I'm a formerly incarcerated person. Um, in 1999, I was involved in a DUI crash. Uh, my best friend got killed sitting next to me, driving home from a bar. Um, and for that, served a little over four years in two uh, state prisons in Pennsylvania. Uh, when I was released, I went to law school and, and started sort of on this education journey. Um, and about four years after I was released, I ended up, you know, I was a barred attorney. I applied for and received approval from the California bar to become a member. Um, my first year of practice, and I talk a little bit about this at the beginning of the book. For those of you who haven't read it, though, it's, I think it's great you know, background um, in terms of introducing myself. So when I, after about a year of practice, learning, you know, first year having a license and sitting second chair on some trials and things like that with some folks that I knew that were maybe more seasoned attorneys, um, I was called for jury duty for the first time in California. And I showed up for my summons and went through the whole process. And um, on the juror qualification questionnaire was a question, have you ever been convicted of a felony or malfeasance in office? To which, of course, I had to answer in the affirmative because I, I did have you know, two felony convictions, to be precise, um, and you know was there to serve. So I checked yes. And what I was told by the, the person organizing the jury service that day, um, they don't call them jury clerks out here, but sort of a commissioner type person, was that essentially I was permanently disqualified from jury duty and that I would never be called again. When I mentioned to this person that, you know, I'm an attorney and I came through the attorney's entrance and I tell this kind of funny joke in the, in the beginning of the book with my little card and feeling all proud of myself, I've tried cases in the same courthouse that you're now telling me I'm never allowed in as a juror, um, their response was simply write your congressperson. So what I did then was to embark on what has turned into, I can't believe it now, about an 11 or 12 year research agenda um, where I really looked at this practice and looked at, okay, uh, what are, why do we do this? Um, are the reasons we do it valid empirically? And then are there unintended consequences from us doing this, right? These jurisdictions that do impose this. And so I set out to really test the rationales to start with and then move into the effects of this practice on juries, on the excluded, and then really on the communities that use it, um, that use exclusion. So that's how I got, I got into this. Uh, prior to this, I had written a lot about parole. Um, I was, again, on active state parole when I wrote about parole. 
So a lot of what I write about is usually sparked by, you know, a personal experience, having been someone who's been through the system. Um, but then the research is, you know, obviously strictly objective. I mean, I'm a researcher first. So, um, but yes, personal experience was what kicked off my interest in this topic. So in your, in your book, and that book, by the way, for uh, anyone who's interested, is 20 Million Angry Men, The Case for Including Convicted Felons in Our Jury System. And I should add, we will be having a book discussion group on this later this summer, um, and we'll have details for, for you on that later. Mm -hmm. But in that book, you mentioned, I think you mentioned three rationales that have been used to justify the exclusion of people who have felony convictions from jury duty. And I think you, you kind of focus on two of them because one of them's not really a, a big one right now. Mm -hmm. But can you kind of give us a rundown of these rationales and why you're not really buying them? Sure. So credit where credit's due. The first real seminal piece on juror exclusion was done by law professor Brian Kalt up at Michigan State. He wrote a fantastic article about this. And it was a theoretical article, meaning you know, he compiled case law and, and sort of put forth these are the most popular justifications. He questioned those in a theoretical way. What I did was try to extend that research and test these, right, empirically. Um, when we look at case law, we see that they're really in legislative histories. What we see are there really three justifications that you pointed out. Now, one is of a philosophical variety, right? And that's the, the idea that because someone has committed a crime and been convicted, they just simply don't deserve to serve as a juror anymore right, that they have broken the social contract, compact, right, um, and that in return, right, they just, by breaking that compact, we, we have, they have exhibited that they cannot be trusted and they just simply don't deserve to, to have this. You know, don't deserve is something that's difficult to test empirically, so I focused more on the practical justifications, which are the ones that most courts cite, right, nearly all courts cite the sort of utilitarian justifications and move away from this philosophical one. The utilitarian justifications are simply well, two, right? The first is this idea that folks who have been convicted of a felony by virtue of having been convicted of a felony reveal uh, their character and they reveal their character to be flawed. Um, courts have been unclear about how this lack of character impacts someone's fitness for jury service, but there's really two best guesses. Um, and Brian Colt talks about these and I do in the book. And the two best guesses are these. The first is that a lack of character somehow will impede the functioning of the jury so that someone with a felony conviction simply won't follow jury instructions or won't apply the law even handedly, right? So that's one concern. A second concern on the character side seems to be the appearance of impropriety, the appearance that juries are not legitimate because they include folks with convictions. So those seem to be the two concerns on the character justification. There's also this more precise justification and when I say more precise, I mean they have articulated it in a precise way. It doesn't hold water empirically, but the justification looks like this. If we were to seat someone with a felony conviction on a jury, um, chances are, and we assume 100% because it's a categorical exclusion, that they would side with a criminal defendant, right? That they would harbor sympathy for criminal defendants and, and animosity towards the state. Um, the evidence doesn't suggest that that's fact, but that is a, a justification that many courts have hung their hat on in um, denying claims that challenge uh, felon juror exclusion law. Yeah, it seems like these uh, rationales kind of sort of point back towards a fear of the use of jury nullification. Uh, now, you've mentioned some research that you've done that kind of uh, helps give some insight into what we could expect if we start including everyone on juries. Can you tell us a little bit about your research and what you found from that? Sure, yeah. Uh, so as I said, I started off looking at the justifications for this. And, and in the first study I ever did on juror exclusion, um, we compared three groups of folks. We compared just plain eligible jurors. We compared el otherwise eligible jurors without a with a felony conviction, I should say. And then we compared folks who were enrolled in law school. And we had 200 some odd um, folks in each group. And we compared them statistically on a measure of pretrial bias. And our hypothesis or the hypothesis that was put forth in terms of the justification was that um, our group of folks with felony convictions, we would see as, as wildly pro-defense, right? Uh, much more so than any other group, so much so that, that their categorical exclusion is warranted. That's what the justification seems to suggest. Uh, what I found was that there was no statistically significant difference between law students and folks with felony convictions um, in that their pretrial biases both were skewed pro-defense when we compare them to the group of jurors that was simply our control. 
mm-hmm. but there was no statistically significant difference between those two groups. Mm-hmm. And I think we can imagine a whole number of other groups identifiable by some characteristic that might harbor a pro-defense bias as well. Um, and I would argue probably isn't statistically different than either law students or folks with felony convictions. So the sum of that is, well, what do we do? Do we exclude all groups of folks that have this pro-defense bias? Or do we allow a process that we have vetted and used for years to work through those biases, right? And allow these folks into the jury selection process if they are in fact too biased that process should work its magic, right? And they should be excluded like any other group of folks. We are the only group, you know, categorically excluded because we have an assumed pretrial bias. I also ran the first mock jury experiment ever that included folks with felony convictions. And what we did was we ran a number of juries. Um, We had a criminal trial that we acted out with actors and real lawyers. Uh, We truncated it so that it would fit into an hour time frame, And then we showed it to a number of mock juries those mock juries then deliberated the case, we videotaped deliberations, and then we coded that data. And what we found was in fact, rather than a lack of character, we found that folks with convictions really took the process seriously. Uh, About half of the folks with convictions in our sample, I believe it was about half, volunteered to be the foreperson. Um, And then we had a number of folks, you know, as we went through and coded the data, um, we coded it for measures of deliberation quality, which are rough, but you know they exist in the literature. And what we found was on raising of novel case facts, so remembering the facts accurately from the from the case and raising them during deliberations, and then also time spoken as a proportion of their deliberations. Folks with convictions actually outperformed folks without convictions, um, and on no measure was that opposite. So on no measure did folks without convictions outperform folks with convictions. So the sum of that is really one. Uh, the threat that is assumed, really, we didn't find. I didn't find a threat that folks were going to undermine the function or the appearance of the jury. Um, and in fact, you know, that which cuts directly against these justifications, uh, folks with convictions seem to add value to deliberations, seemed to make deliberations smoother um, and more thorough. So I, I really want to dig into this, uh, the impartiality uh, mm-hmm. question that you kind of addressed a little bit first. Um, it seems like, and you mentioned that uh, law students and um, people who had felony convictions had a bias toward defendants. And, and I have so many questions about that. <laughs> first of all, I think most people that I have kind of observed in recent weeks since the uh, Derek Chauvin trial, they seem to have some ideas about what it means to be an impartial juror that I I think maybe should be um, gotten into in a little bit in depth. Is an impartial juror someone who like has no no opinions or like, how, do, how does this fit into the impartial juror uh, picture or impartial jury? Can you explain a little bit about what that means and why, you know, people who may have a bias one way or the other? Because I notice there's never seems to be a question. If someone says they like police, they're always on the, that's fine. The government has no problem letting them on the jury. But when we have a bias pro defendant, people are like, oh, they're biased, not impartial. Can you talk a little bit about that? I don't know. I'm sure I asked a real question there. No, I, no, absolutely. And so to start with, you know, in terms of the bias, I mean, let's, let's be clear, right? This bias justification is really only valid on the criminal side, right? <laughs> now, these exclusions apply both on the civil side and on the criminal side. Only one state, <coughs> Oregon, um, divides between, you know, restrictions having to do with civil cases and restrictions for those with convictions having to do with criminal cases. In all other states, criminal and civil are treated equally. Mm-hmm. So the justification really holds no water on the civil side and we'll see on the criminal side, right? That's where we're at right. with this. What I can tell you is empirically, it doesn't look like it holds water on the, on the criminal side okay. either. Um, when you asked, you know, are we supposedly are we striving for a tabula rasa, right? Like are we sh- are striving for these blank slate jurors that have never watched the news and don't know anything? Um, I don't think that's a realistic conception of the jury. I think Abramson talks about this in We the Jury, right? That there's sort of two conceptions. And I think not a balancing of biases, but allowing for you know the inclusion of folks with different perspectives, mm-hmm. I think is what the jury always was supposed to be, right? Mm-hmm. I think now 
um, those folks are then included and then they all take part in, again, this process that we vetted for a whole not lot of years, right? This jury selection process mm-hmm. uh, of what are and, 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 and then, you know, um, challenges for cause and peremptory strikes, right? Through that, alleg- you know, arguably we will get to an impartial jury, which will be folks that are not blank slates, but are folks who have experiences, but mm-hmm. have convinced us or made us confident that they can put those, use those experiences in ways that are impartial, right? Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what we saw in this mock jury experiment that we did with folks with convictions. Um, the defendant in the, in the mock jury case was a, a, had a prior conviction. So at mm-hmm. the time that he was accused of doing this robbery in the case, um, he was on parole and was scared to not, you know, that he was gonna miss his parole meeting with his parole officer. Well, folks in the deliberation room who have no experience with the system, didn't really understand the gravity, right, of missing a meeting with your parole officer, being accused of absconding or whatever comes after that. The folks in the room who had been through the system, the folks with convictions, sort of explained that in detail to the other, you know, the the folks without convictions in the room. And really it made for a rich deliberation that was far more layered than it would have been had no one had any experience with parole or known anything about what it means to miss a meeting. So in that way, I think the people that that we saw and observed that had convictions really did draw on this past that was arguably deviant in ways that helped with the process, right? Right. Um, And I think that really is the vision of the jury. At least it's my vision. It's the vision I thought I learned in sixth grade in social studies class. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, One of the things that um, I've read a study on is that basically, you know, when you exclude people from lower income levels, you're taking out certain kinds of, of deliberation. And, and what you just said reminded me of that. And the example uh, given in the paper I read was that you know when a jury is presented with evidence that the person who's accused of the crime had a knife with them, wealthy people, high income people are jump to, oh, they were intending to do something wrong. They intended to harm someone. But lower income people are more likely to consider, oh, maybe this person was carrying that to protect themselves. Maybe they use it in their job. Right. So it really changes the quality of the deliberation and include, you know, people like just like you're saying. I, I wonder if you could give us some uh, some scope of what is the magnitude of this? Who are the people being excluded? How many? You know, what just some of the characteristics that we're missing out on? Yeah, so I mean, we, we have getting a count on who is walking around in the United States with a felony conviction is sort of a difficult task, right? Because after we've, for lack of a better term, sort of expired, right? Our time in the systems expired, meaning I got off parole, let's say. I'm not on a ledger anywhere anymore. So I wouldn't be counted, let's say, if you looked at state statistics or even federal statistics in California, I would be not. But there are many folks like me. So the estimates are around 20, 21 million people in the United States who walk around with a felony conviction. Now, obviously, this, this, these restrictions are not going to affect all of them because some live in places where they're allowed to serve. Um, these restrictions are prevalent, though. I mean, you know, when we think about voting, there's only a handful of states, and it's even less than a handful these days, that permanently exclude folks from being able to vote once they have some felony conviction. For juries, it's 26 states and then the federal government, right? Um, Eliminates permanently your ability to serve if you have a felony conviction. Other states do things a little different. They have hybrid sort of restrictions where maybe one class of offender, and I don't like that word, but it just makes it easier. One class of offender, right, is is excluded permanently, like in California for folks that are registrable, uh, folks with sex offenses, they're still excluded permanently, but anyone else with a different felony conviction are allowed to serve once their time on parole or probation has expired. Um, States do it where maybe your probation or parole has expired and then there's a number of years until you're now eligible to serve again. DC's done it that way for years. Mm -hmm. So it is the most prevalent restriction on, I think, folks' ability to take part in democratic processes or at least folks with with convictions. Now, when we look at the demographics of this group, um, it's predictable. I mean, anyone who knows anything about sort of our prison system or, or our correctional clients, right, knows that they are, you know, primarily folks of color, uh, primarily folks with lower education levels, primarily folks with lower socioeconomic status, um, high prevalence of addiction issues, high prevalence of mental health issues. So, you know, those are the folks that this is going to impact long term when they're released. Yeah. And one of the things that kind of popped into my head reading, reading some of that was, 
that some of these people, I don't know how many, but it seems like it's probably a lot, are people who either A, wouldn't have been convicted in the first place if they'd had a fully informed jury because of the, the nature of what they were accused of, um, or B, those things are being legalized now, <laughs> aka marijuana. So it, it seems like a little weird that people who were convicted of, say, marijuana-related offenses when they were illegal would be excluded even after those things are legalized either in state or possibly coming up at some point, I'm not sure, but there seems to be some talk about it, you know, at the federal level, like that, because they will have that conviction on their record, they would still be excluded. Yeah. So, I mean, I think Darren Wheelock um, did some work on juror exclusion uh, prior to me starting my work on it. And he sort of did one of the first, I think the only empirical study prior to my own. And he looked at exclusion in Georgia. He looked at permanent exclusion there. And what he found was that in fact, um, these restrictions, this permanent exclusion in Georgia would racially homogenize juries. It lowered the number of expected, in this case, African-American adult males that we expected in jury pools, right? We accepted this number and lowered that number because of the exclusion. So what we see is a sort of homogenization of juries. Now, he talks in that paper about this sort of insidious feedback loop. And I think it's a great way to think about this is that the folks that are most likely to, you know, become involved in our criminal justice system, I mean, statistics tell us are folks of color. Well, now, once those folks are involved in our criminal justice system and are, you know, affixed with this label felon, they are also the folks that are now excluded permanently from jury service in almost every, in, in the vast majority of jurisdictions. So when we talk about diverse juries, and I mean diverse in terms of race, gender, and also experience, what we're, we're doing, right, is making it more likely that these folks will fall victim to the system because we're essentially removing that perspective from the system. And so what we have then is this sort of drain loop that continues. Right. Um, you know, and when studies tell us that the inclusion of folks of color, you know, making of diverse juries, that the public actually looks at verdicts uh, rendered by such juries and really the process by which those verdicts were rendered as far more just and fair if they view the jury as more diverse. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, does that, does that also work when we talk about diversity of experience rather than diversity of just race or, or, um, or gender? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, we're conducting that study right now in Wyoming oh. and I'm happy to report oh. back once we have that data. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on my list to hit sure. you up for the results of that. Uh, uh, preliminarily, I will say it appears the same effect is there. So when we ask okay. the public, do you feel that a jury that included folks with convictions and rendered X verdict um, is, was a more fair process than a jury that was more homogenous that rendered X verdict, um, the public seemed to suggest that like race and gender, uh, diversity of experience makes them feel more comfortable, yeah. makes them view these verdicts as okay. more legitimate. Out of curiosity, why Wyoming? Uh, I'm working with the experimental psychology lab okay. there. It's a national, <laughs> it's a national survey. That's all. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I thought I thought we were talking jurors in Wyoming, and I'm like, no, no, it's like an odd choice. But no, I'm following you now. <laughs> so, in the last week or two, I'm not sure anymore. Um, a federal district judge in Ohio, I believe, had to rescind his own order. He had uh, put an order that nobody who was not vaccinated for COVID-19 could be a juror in this particular case coming up. And then it, it became clear that was going to exclude like 40 to 50% of the community. <laughs> and so he rescinded that because there's this requirement that the jury be drawn from a fair cross section of the community. And that seemed like a rather large chunk, uh, particularly given that the vaccination issue skews on uh, gender lines, political lines, income and education level lines, all these various demographic um, racial lines, et cetera. And so it was going to exclude people from all of those groups disproportionately. Um, I think in your book, you said that like 8% of American adults are basically eliminated from uh, with, the, with the felony conviction restriction. Can you tell us, uh, I'm, I'm thinking those, that probably skews mostly men, mm -hmm. uh, mostly people of color. Mm -hmm. um, is there like geographical or income or educational or other elements that, that would, would be one side or the other of those would be 
disproportionately removed from the jury pool that way? So I don't have that, that data, um, okay. but what I will tell you, so yeah, the last study that came out in 2018, where we tried to quantify the number of folks with convictions in the United States, it came out that it was roughly 20 million, 19, 20 million at the time. Um, that represented 8% of our adult population. Uh, and for African-American adult males, it was one in three. Um, mm -hmm. So 33% were walking around with a felony yeah. conviction. So I think the, the, the statistics given in that paper, right, and what they did in that demography article, I think really suggests that, yes, they're skewed male, they're skewed uh, racial minority, and they're skewed socioeconomic, mm -hmm. lower socioeconomic levels. So, And have any defendants, like people who are actually having a jury trial, have they challenged the exclusion of those people? Um, often we'll see like, oh, hey, this jury pool wasn't fair because uh, the, uh, there was one, one situation, I don't remember which state, where the system for calling is sending out summonses accidentally left out millennials <laughs> accidentally i don't know if it actually was but it was it was going by birth date and that hadn't gotten updated so like this huge segment of people just never got any jury summons <laughs> and so that was challenged has anything like that happened as far as uh hey these people are being excluded from my jury pool and that's not fair and and if so what what sort of happened yeah so there's generally, you know, we see that there have been two sort of types of legal challenges to the exclusion of folks with convictions. The first um, were, were, are really cross-section claims. And I'm sure your listeners, you all probably talk about cross-section claims a lot. In the case of folks with convictions, the sticking point for cross-section claims is we can't make a prima facie case for a cross-section claim in part because no court has ever recognized folks with convictions as a distinct group. Um, distinct in a way that we represent an opinion that can't be represented by anyone else that possibly would be allowed to serve as jurors, right? So that's one of the prongs of the sort of distinctiveness test, and I think it's in Taylor v. Louisiana. We have not been able to meet that prima facie case. So we don't even get to the second part of the fair cross-section analysis, which is, you know, whether or not this is an appropriate exclusion, right? We, we haven't Second way, this has been challenged is through equal protection, where f litigants have been given standing to challenge on behalf of excluded jurors. Um, those have failed also consistently and uniformly because one, we don't recognize jury service as a fundamental right. Um, I've argued right the opposite in a number of papers. I've argued that it should at least be given increased protections as an important right, because historically it was seen that way. Um, my argument has not been bought. <laughs> um, so no court has elevated jury service to an important or fundamental right. And also folks with convictions are not a protected class. So we don't get above rational basis uh, on our equal protection side, which is a very sort of state deferential standard. Um, and what we see then is courts upholding the exclusion on equal protection grounds. Mm -hmm. So those challenges have, have not um, been successful. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's probably more fertile ground if I was pushed maybe on the equal protection side for the argument that jury service shooting, I've argued this shooting should receive increased protections, raise up to sort of a, a, a strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny where we could um, you know, really make the case that this is not, in, this is not a compelling interest for the state. Mm -hmm. um, in part because there's a mechanism there for weeding out the things that we're worried about. Um, why not let that mechanism, and I'm speaking about jury selection, why not let that mechanism happen and let these folks take part in that mechanism mm -hmm. um, as we do anyone else, right? Um, the argument goes, right, we're sort of jury mandering, right? I've made that argument because, you know, we allow folks, we, we're really not, as you mentioned, you know, we're not worried about certain biases, but we really are worried about other ones. And I think that's where we get into uh, sort of viewpoint discrimination a little bit. And I, I make yeah. that argument in the book. Yeah, I want to I want to go down that path a little bit here. Um, I've noticed while reading the book, I noticed a couple of weird dichotomies that um, seem to not make any sense. So perhaps you can comment on these. One is that uh, there seems to be this: oh, people who have been convicted of felonies can't be impartial and fair, but yet police judges and lawyers are all able to be jurors in some places. Some, some places they're excluded, but how are they more impartial when they're, I mean, it, it's not like they're a third party bystander not involved in the process. They, they're in there, they're just on a different side. And the, the other kind of dichotomy um, popped out at me. I think you said back in the day in England, you know, long ago, um, 
all the things that they were excluded from included, they couldn't even testify as witnesses. And I thought about that and I thought, you know what, not only, as you point out in the book, can people who've been convicted of felonies serve as lawyers, i.e. spend a career doing something when they're excluded from one single day of jury service, but we even have witnesses who are currently incarcerated, who you know, are accused of very serious things, who we trust them as witnesses, but we can't trust them as jurors. <laughs> how, do, how do we make sense of this? Or, or is, is, is there a way to make sense of it? Yeah, I know, I'm not sure I can. I mean, this is really, you know, when we, when we think about this exclusion, it's really unique in that this is the only group that we assume we know how this group thinks en masse. And we assume that the way that this group thinks is so threatening to our jury system that this group needs to be categorically excluded. Um, none of those presumptions bear out in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the research, right? What we see is a normal distribution of pretrial biases such that you know, one third of a population of folks with convictions that I studied was actually pro-prosecution, right? So to assume yeah. things I think about an entire group, um, I think is in error, right? And I think that yeah. the, the empirical evidence backs that up. Um, but so I really can't, you know, I, I talk a, 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 in the book about other contexts where I think the law is sort of, you know, doesn't really get it right or, or is confused, right? And I talk about my own situation as being an attorney and being able to navigate a pretty extensive moral character and fitness process, right? Proving that I am of character to be able to practice law and not threaten my clients or the profession. Um, but yet I'm not of character to be able to sit in judgment in even a minor civil yeah. dispute, right? Yeah. A fence dispute or something. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know how those things work. I, I just finished a piece about, you know, the, the recent impeachment, not, you know, recent anymore, but our most recent impeachment trials. And this idea that, you know, jurors take an oath, right? They swear to be impartial and, you know, Senate jurors swore to be impartial too, but many, you know, went on television and talked all about what they were going to do after they were sworn in, right? Well, that gets most of us excluded from jury duty, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I find it ironic that in that setting, um, I would argue a lack of character, flouting your oath, mm -hmm. um, you know, th 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 that's acceptable. But yet yeah. the same senators will vote um, and mm -hmm. will uphold the federal permanent exclusion on jury duty um, for fear that someone will demonstrate a lack of character and yeah. not follow their oath. So I'm, yeah. I'm confused. You know, so. Yeah. And, and I think you also mentioned in the book that it's not like, you know, J random person off the street who's called a jury duty is getting some sort of character fitness test when they go there. Right. And uh, I have heard so many cases of people who, I want to credit jurors because by and large, I think they do try to do a good job, but there are still a lot of people who are like, it's Friday, I want to get out of mm -hmm. here. Just whatever everyone else thinks I'll go along with. Or, you know, they they have some some agenda that they came in with, something like that. There, there are a lot of people who get through that and it's not like they had a character fitness test or anything. So it's not clear to me why suddenly that's an issue. It, it seems like there are just so many double standards in this area. Well, it's also, it also comes down to, you know, what do we think about, I talk a lot about in the book about this is what do we think about character, right? And is what is character, right? Let's start with that. And does it, is it changing? Meaning if I show you that maybe I don't have the best character by committing a crime, is that character ever you know, rehabilit you know, you know, redeemable, right? Can I ever rehabilitate yeah. my character? The law seems to suggest that in many contexts, character is absolutely redeemable, right? Or, or right. rehabilitatable. <laughs> but in this context, if you commit a crime and you reveal this quote unquote character flaw, you are forever excluded from this, yeah. what I would argue, crucial civic process, mm -hmm. right? Do you have any thoughts on what, like why, jury service has been singled out because as you mentioned there's so many other areas where it's widely considered oh you, you're you can be redeemed for this you can be redeemed for that but this one thing which by the way you point out in your book isn't even that common anymore right, right. <laughs> like why is this the thing that do you have any insight on why why the hang-up is on this thing you know, I, I don't other than to say, you know, this, this was something, this is really a vestige, right, of, of what we used to do. And what we saw, I mean, it, they did this, you know, the Crown did this, and, and we saw that policy, right, sort of imported into the colonies and then spread throughout the states. Um, and really, it was this, 
sort of cult says this, and in my research, I found this, is this sort of blind acceptance of the practice, right? And this sort of knee-jerk logic that, well, of course, we don't want folks who have been in prison serving as jurors. But when pressed, right, when someone says that as sort of this, you know, accepted logical thing, when pressed, it's really hard, right, on that logical string to explain why it is that that doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. um, and what the evidence tells us is that that is illogical, right? That, mm -hmm. that the assumption about this population, um, a huge population in the United States is, is, is completely in error. Mm -hmm. So to kind of uh, take that apart a bit, I would like to kind of turn you loose on two questions to uh, wax eloquent on these. Okay. <laughs> One is why is it good for the community to include people convicted of felonies on juries and, and specific examples would be great. Like the one you gave before, if you have additional specific examples mm -hmm. and then to kind of flip it around, is it also good for the person who has been convicted of a felony to have that opportunity? And, you know, any, again, specific examples would be great or, mm -hmm. or general comments go for it. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, so here's the way this works indirectly to benefit communities. And I would argue directly to benefit the folks who are excluded. So, you know, we, when we, in criminology, right, and, and there's sort of competing theories in other disciplines, right, but in criminology, when we talk about folks, you know, ceasing a criminal career, we talk about criminal desistance, right, and probably, you know, some names include Shad Maruna and some other folks who wrote a lot about this, right, um, and, and, and the idea with desistance is that for someone to leave a criminal lifestyle, the, the theory goes, that someone has to undergo some self-concept change. They need to start viewing themselves not as the person who committed this terrible crime, but as someone who is now a pro-social, productive citizen in the moment and will be in the future. It's very difficult for someone to rectify a criminal past with a law-abiding present when um, they're reminded perpetually that they are this thing, which is a convicted felon, right? Which is someone who broke the law maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, so permanent exclusions are, you know, destructive to a criminal desistance process because of that, right? They impede the ability for someone to undergo this change in self-concept. And they do so because one, they remind the person constantly. So when this person is trying to construct a desistance narrative, we call it, it's borderline impossible to, right? Because it's difficult to explain how you could be both people. The other way it impedes it is, is we, we know from research that when folks come home, folks who have committed crimes, they tend to, you know, encounter these roles and these life turning points. Maybe they get married, maybe they have a child, maybe they get a job they've always wanted. And when they do, right, they start to um, fulfill those roles of father, of husband, of, you know, worker or you know, teacher, let's say. And those roles, right, they have certain strictures that tell you how you need to behave to be good at this role and how you shouldn't behave if you want to be good at this role. And so what we find is folks trying to desist from crime, trying to rebuild their lives, trying to reenter, tend to take on these roles and strive to fill them um, in accordance with these strictures. So then they start to see themselves as that role first. So now I'm father first, oh, formerly incarcerated person second, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So for communities who have, let's say, permanent exclusions, they are consistently reminding someone, right, who's aware of this or who maybe like me gets called and then is publicly dismissed, right, mm -hmm. that they are a criminal, that they are someone who society doesn't trust. And in a very public way, we're telling you that. You checked the box that said you had a felony conviction. Goodbye. We'll never call you for jury service again. So that can be that's, you know, and I, I don't make the argument in the book that if we allow folks to serve on juries, all of a sudden recidivism will drop and it's going to be kumbaya. I don't suggest that. What right. I suggest, though, is this exclusion is part of a larger network of collateral consequences of a conviction. Um, and it's one piece. And if you know, we need to start, I think, breaking apart that tapestry if mm -hmm. we want to really be, you know, if we really want to observe rehabilitation and really want to be true to what that means. Right. Mm -hmm. As far as communities go. The desistance process after this self-transformation also involves community engagement. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that that's sort of the last step of desistance is that the community needs to welcome this person back into the community. And then it's not a one-way street. The person welcomed back needs to behave accordingly, right? To contribute mm -hmm. in pro-social ways. Right. Communities that eliminate that opportunity, right? That, that, that don't welcome this person back in a public way, that don't give this person the ability to, or the opportunity to contribute to, 
they're it, it, harming, I would argue, right, mm-hmm. the community, right, in that mm-hmm. it makes it more difficult for this person to fully reintegrate. Now, also, they're harming the community directly um, by eliminating what I would argue and what the data tells us is a valuable perspective from the deliberation room. So mm-hmm. not only have you made jury trials in your local community, I would argue worse because these folks are not taking part, you've also made it more difficult for the folks you're concerned about to reintegrate. So those are some of the, some of the ways that it can impact both the people excluded and also the communities that exclude. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it sounds like from uh, our, a previous question I asked that uh, litigation is not a fruitful avenue for changing this, but legislation uh, seems to be, uh, I, I, ha- I don't have a full inventory, but each year I, I do several searches on legislation for jury issues. And it seems like this is not necessarily passing frequently, but it's becoming introduced legislation more frequently. And uh, if I recall correctly, California that you mentioned, uh, they just changed their law last year. Is that correct? Yeah, in 2021, okay. January, um, the, new, oh, okay. the new law started, right? When okay. it, it was voted on in 2020. Okay. Um, yeah, they passed SB 310, mm-hmm. which was introduced by Senator Nancy Skinner of Berkeley. And, um, you know, the bill initially was to make California like Maine no restriction at all. Um, Folks are released from prison. They're immediately eligible for jury service. And later, Prop 17 made them immediately able to vote, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, It didn't go that far. So the SB 310, there were some concessions, there were some crafting of the bill, some givebacks. And I think one of those was um, folks on supervision are not allowed to serve in California. So the new loss, it was a permanent exclusion state. Now, uh, folks with felony convictions can serve once their commitment to the state has expired. So once they're finished with parole probation and folks who have a 290 registrable sex offense in California are still permanently excluded. So it really is a hybrid jurisdiction now. They haven't lifted the exclusion entirely, but a huge step forward um, Mm -hmm. for a progressive state that you probably should have done this years ago, given the evidence. Yeah. And are there any um, studies or um, any data or anything from California or Maine or any place else that uh, would be helpful to people who are, are trying to promote sort of opening that up more in other states. I, I don't know if there's anything uh, talking about how uh, outcomes are different, if they are at all, or uh, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what. You're the researcher. Yeah. <laughs> you probably yeah. know what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. So we, we found no difference in an in, in outcome, but you know, again, that wasn't our focus, right? Our yeah. focus really was the experience. What does it yeah. look like during mm-hmm. the deliberations? Now, in terms of, and I, and I take your question. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, what it looks like in Maine, let's say someone, they haven't had a restriction since I believe the sixties, right? Mm-hmm. And what it looks like there is that it's a functioning jury system. Mm-hmm. Um, they treat all jurors that come through in an individualized way. Um, I was sort of astonished to learn that judges in Maine have, a, a sort of standard set of questions that they ask folks with convictions, um, not you know predetermined. Judges sort of came up with these on their own. They just happen to be very consistent, mm-hmm. um, and they are you know well, what was the crime you were convicted of? You know, was it the same thing as we're asking you to serve on this jury for? Um, how long ago was the crime? Uh, how you know? Do you feel that you know, it, you know your incarceration benefited you? Do you feel that you know how have you done since you've been released? really questions I think you would ask any juror who had a unique life experience that you were concerned might impact their ability as as their fitness, right? Right. So there wasn't, and I will say for those rural jurisdictions, for folks from those rural jurisdictions that are on this, um, Maine, one of the, one of the, I think the primary drivers of them lifting the sort of mini exclusion they had back in the sixties was getting more jurors, right? There's some really rural parts of Maine. And so any exclusion was going to impact them being able to fill jury boxes. And so there was a practical aspect to that as well. Um, so I think rural communities could benefit from this. It really just depends on uh, whether or not yeah. they're interested. Right. Yeah. So it, it, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like how to make the argument on the one hand, I feel like outcomes aren't different says, there is no harm in doing this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, on the other hand, it also kind of seems to like you could turn around and say, well, it's not necessary based on the outcome. So is there any data about other thing, uh, other effects that people could use to say, hey, 
maybe it doesn't change the outcome, but it has these other beneficial effects. I, yeah, I don't know how I you would do that. It seems like it'd be tough, but. No, I mean, the studies we did are generalizable. I mean, we had representative samples, you know, it was a true jury experiment. So, you know, we, mm -hmm. it was randomly assigned to conditions. Um, and I think the benefits that you can estimate, you know, receiving, if you were to mm -hmm. lift this exclusion are, I think you will have better quality deliberations. That's okay. what the, the, the studies tell us. Yeah. And also um, the folks that go through the process, okay. right? Let's not forget, right? The jury is, what did Tocqueville call it? You know, the, the, the greatest public school that's always open. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So the jury is informative, right? It's, it's educative. And I think mm -hmm. that anyone who goes through that process learns a little bit about our court system learns a little bit about what it means to deliberate with your fellow citizens, right, in a respectful way. And I think that could benefit folks who have been yeah. through the system, who are maybe dis disattached, yeah. right, or, or, or disaffected, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think there's that aspect to it. So I think you can receive a benefit for the folks that are excluded, but also for your jury system. And as I said, communities, you know, if these folks go through this system, are real, feel like they're welcomed back, it could go a long way towards them, you know, seeking out right. that job they wanted or, right. you know, the things that we ask them to do yeah. to rebuild their lives after incarceration. So yeah. uh, I just want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, uh, feel free if you're on Zoom to click the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, or if you're on Facebook, put your question in the comments. Um, I'm going to save the last few minutes for Professor Banal to have the last word. But before we get there, I want to give you that opportunity if you do have any questions. <laughs> um, and I, I just want to kind of jump off of something that you, you mentioned in your last comment, which was um, something to the effect about like people deliberating. You, you kind of have to talk with other people who aren't pre-selected to be like you. <laughs> They're not, you know, you're in people who you would normally socialize with necessarily or whatever. And it seems like not even just for people who've been convicted of felonies, but for all of us, that is a huge benefit to kind of have that opportunity to be put in a situation where we're not sort of in our, our own little echo chamber, you know, hearing the same things all the time. And to have that perspective, most people probably you know, are thinking, oh, I'm not, I'm not really in those social circles where I would be talking to someone convicted of a felony. <laughs> but, you know, where, whereas you get put in that in the jury uh, 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 deliberation, you're talking to everyone. And I feel like that is something that can really help people have a, not just in the deliberation or in the case, but have that broader perspective when they walk out of the, the jury deliberation room. I'm trying to think of how that sort of effect might be measurable if, or if it even is. It, it, seems like, it seems like it's very helpful to have something measurable to take when you're, when you're trying to make an argument for legislation, but not necessarily all of the really good effects that we would see would be measurable, but. Yeah, so I mean, we, I talk a little bit about this in the book too, right? This inner group contact theory idea. And, and it wasn't my own. I mean, some folks wrote about it on the civil side. And, and the idea really is if we put folks together from let's say diametrically opposite you know, backgrounds or, or life experiences, and we ask them to work cooperatively, right? To achieve a task. Uh, what we found is that you know, prejudice and stereotypes and, and maybe some discriminatory thought, those walls tend to break down after this cooperative experience, right? And so I think the jury, you know, I don't think the jury gets enough credit. And that's why I love talking to jury nerds, right? I don't think the jury gets enough credit as this school, right? And this, and this place where adults come together and talk about something that is, could be gravely important, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't see eye to eye on maybe anything else, right? But they're there to do that job. Now, I would ask someone, you know, maybe you've never had an experience with someone with a felony conviction. If you sat in a jury room with this person, a deliberation room for a week, and they were respectful to you, and they worked hard to try to get to an outcome, and they, you know, admitted to you that they had this conviction, which is what we saw from all of our participants, right? You're going to take away, I think, a different feeling, I would argue, about our population, given that you just yeah. had this really positive experience with someone that was convicted, right? Right, right. So I think, so I think that's another way that it can impact the community indirectly. Um, mm -hmm. And I think yeah. we, don't, we don't give the jury enough credit for what it can do, I think, for folks that go through yeah. that system. Yeah. Uh, I do have a, a question from a participant. Sure. Um, could we cover how uh, just regular people 
J random person off the street can help. Like, what do we need to be telling our legislatures that we want? Um, is there anything you can point us to maybe for like model language or um, talking points or anything like that? Yeah, I think I wrote the book, I think, in, with this in mind, right? Because what I saw in California, you know, I worked with Senator Skinner's office once we made contact, but I also worked on prior efforts in California. What I found was that the, the research, a lot of it is a little scattered and some of it's behind paywalls and things like that. So what I tried to do with my research on this topic um, and anyone else who's done empirical research is to put it all in one place so that legislators and folks who craft the bills can really see the, you know, the benefits and the drawbacks of you know, the types of legislation that are out there that exist. Look, I will say, right, um, the give backs in California, I wasn't for them. I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't wanna speak for Senator Skinner, but I think initially what we tried to do or what she tried to do was to get this bill through without any carve outs, right? What this devolves into a lot is this really emotive argument. So I'll just tell one, small quick anecdote that's in the book is, you know, I sat in a room testifying about this um, to, you know, state lawmakers. And in response to, you know, reams of empirical evidence that I presented, you know, suggesting that this practice maybe ought to be rethought, what I was met with was, well, we can't allow folks who are on supervision to serve because what if they get violated, it would disrupt the trial process. To say nothing of the, alter of the alternates that have already been sworn in, um, to say nothing of, say, the guy who walks across the street to get a hot dog from the cart during his lunch break and gets hit by a car, has a broken leg, now he can't serve. Well, mm -hmm. What do we do? I mean, we don't shut courthouses down when a juror can't continue. Yeah. That's why we have alternates. I was also met with the argument, well, if we allow folks with convictions to serve on juries, we're going to have to increase courthouse security across the state because now we're going to have more felons walking around the courthouse. Uh, just an absolutely insulting, ridiculous argument, right? And, and, but these emotive pleas are what take the place when you don't have, I would argue, empirical evidence to back up your position. So I, I gotta touch that last one because that's killing me. Mm -hmm. Like, why do we need more? If we've let people out of incarceration, it's not like we like follow them around, making sure every minute of their day they're they're not doing like what. It seems like it's almost like the courthouse is treated, and and I've seen this in more in in other contexts, but it's like this special place that's somehow extra vulnerable when in fact it's kind of the opposite it's already like hugely beefed up you know I, I i was i took a photograph inside a federal courthouse not knowing <laughs> apparently they don't like that <laughs> and i, I had uh, my dad had given me some bolo ties and my friend robert and i were uh, watching an argument and so i was giving one of them to him and i thought my dad would like a, you know, like to see a picture of it on him. So I took a picture, like a white wall, my friend, a bolo, nothing, no, no other person in the picture. And I had a federal marshal on me like that. I was just like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like we, we think something bad could happen because someone who we have already said is cleared for, you know, release into society, they might be here. I, well, that, and I'll remind folks, right? No one's, a, a no one's a convicted felon until they, they yeah. commit a crime, right? So there's lots of folks in that courthouse that, we, that are statistically more likely, right. even though they don't have records, to commit a crime than there are folks who've already committed a crime. Right. So look, um, I think the arguments are specious and I think they have no backing, and those, those types of arguments. And I think when we really dig into the data, it makes it clear that, look, this practice, the utility of this practice is really in question. Um, in terms of what folks can do, Look, I would say ask your legislators to, to take the view of the jury that pretty much it was, has always been, which is it needs to be as inclusive as possible, right? Juries function the best when they're inclusive. And I think, you know, to say inclusive is great, except for these folks is not really inclusive. And I think that's what, that would be the word, the takeaway, right? Is that, right. Um, I think that would be the push that I would advocate for. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I don't see any more questions from uh, listeners. So what I'm gonna do is give you the last, uh, looks like we have about six minutes. Feel free to, feel free to uh, fill in any gaps we might have left. Um, if there's anything you'd like to re-emphasize, go ahead and do that. And at the same time, I'm posting some links in the chat on Zoom if you would like to find out more about Professor Benal's work and activities click those. Uh, I'll have some Fiji links as well and also in the comments on Facebook. 
And I'm going to turn it over to you to have the last word. Thank you. And again, Kristen, thank you for having me. Um, you know, one of the things you, you mentioned this, and I want to come back to it. You asked sort of what does it look like now that SB 310 is passed in California? Um, I will say I had a huge project planned, um, SB 310, you know, passed and then COVID hit. And what you know, jury trials were put on hold for a number of months, and then they resumed in a sort of weird way, and then they were put on hold again in the fall and the winter. So we're now getting ramped back up, and we've changed our data collection period to now, right, to start to take a look. And we are looking at what is this like on the ground after SB 310? Are we seeing prosecutors or defense attorneys, right, let's be fair, simply excluding folks with convictions um, you know, so keeping the status quo on the ground through peremptory challenge, right, or peremptory strikes. Is that what's going on? Um, are, you know, are the folks being excluded? You know, what are the race of those folks? So is this having this indirect whitewashing of jury effect, right? Um, okay. Or direct, however, you know, however you look at it. So those, that data will be around, we'll, we will have that data by the end of, I hope this calendar year, we can start working on it. We're doing some interviews with attorneys around the state. We're doing some interviews with formerly incarcerated people around the state to find out you know, what did this change mean for you know, folks trying cases, folks deciding cases, and then you know, the folks that are actually impacted by this. Um, so that data should be here soon. Again, we have this project going in Wyoming where we're talking about you know, the legitimacy of the jury, the outward appearance of the jury to the general public. Um, do they view verdicts and jury decisions as more or less fair, more or less legitimate when they include folks with convictions? Early returns on that data suggest that they do. Um, and we're also looking at some other aspects, you know, of civil trials now. So I, I focus mostly um, on criminal trials in the course of my work, largely because I think the rationales play more to the criminal side. Um, but folks have asked a lot about, well, what are the dynamics like on the civil side? And so we we started some studies in California and nationwide um, with a guy I write with from University of Miami, uh, Nick Peterson, and we've done some work on that. And so the civil stuff should be out, we're hoping, next year. And I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Some damage award stuff, liability stuff, so things like that. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let everyone know the very last link I have shared with you is a survey. And uh, Professor Benal has been so kind as to forward me a flyer with a discount code for his book, uh, 20 Million Angry Men. And uh, I keep, every time I say that, I'm like, I said 20, not 12, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little paranoid about that. I'm going to be like 12 million. No, I, wrong. No, <laughs> 20 million angry men. Um, and if you fill out that survey, uh, I will be sending it out, out an email tomorrow to uh, give you that uh, flyer with a discount code. And you might want that because uh, I don't have them up on the calendar yet, but that's for this afternoon. We will be hosting a uh, book discussion group on this book and Professor Banal has said he may be available to join us absolutely for, for a session or, or so. Uh, so I hope that you'll join us. It is, I, I tell you, you can kind of see, I've only had this book for a couple of weeks and already it's getting warped <laughs> by use. And I've got my, my favorite bookmark in there, the pen. <laughs> and I, I have to tell you, one of the things that I love that I'm just going to, say that I love the amount of footnotes in here. <laughs> like I'm originally an engineer by training. So I like data and I like everything documented. And this is just amazingly well documented. So uh, so much stuff in here to talk about. And we'll be doing that over, I think we'll probably take about three weeks to do that. So uh, we'll, we'll hope, hopefully some of you will be joining us. Uh, one want to thank everyone for joining us here on Zoom. Uh, nice comment. Uh, thank you. This was excellent. Thank you for joining us. Kirsten, I just threw my email in there just in case anyone has any questions oh, they want to reach out. Yeah. And I'll cop if you don't mind, I'll copy and paste that to Facebook. Is that all right with you? Sure. Yep. All right. There you go on Facebook. And uh, again, thank you for joining us on Facebook. If you want to uh, review this later, the uh, broadcast will be up on the Fija Facebook page at... Uh, facebook.com slash Fiji national. And I will also be editing it up into a nice pretty version <laughs> that we will be posting on YouTube. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the enjoyable conversation. I too am constantly seeking out fellow jury nerds. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was nice to really be able to dig into that with you. <laughs> 
Um, and I, I just can't tell you how grateful I am for you sharing your wisdom and for taking on this topic that is, I can see how it would be so easily overlooked. So many of, so many jury issues are like swept aside because it's like, we don't have that many jury trials. You only do it once, you know, it, no one really wants to do it, which is wrong. I, I desperately want to, <laughs> you know, but it just gets so easily swept aside that to have someone dig so deeply into it and someone who is so meticulous about it, I'm very grateful. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it.